Their mission was top secret, expendable. Few, if any, were expected to return. They were outnumbered and outgunned, their ranks decimated by disease and exhaustion. Loyalty, the will to survive, and a belief in their cause were the only things that kept them alive. Their efforts were heroic, their exploits legendary. They were Merrill's Marauders, next on Dangerous Missions. In 1944, a regiment of American soldiers conducted secret missions behind enemy lines in the country then known as Burma. Considered by some to be misfits, for six months these warriors took on Imperial Japan's finest battle-tested troops in continuous brutal combat and emerged victorious. Operating under the codename Galahad, History remembers them as Merrill's Marauders. Some of them were misfits and probably were uh, uh, shoved into this by commanding officers who wanted to get rid of them. And some of those suddenly became some of our best soldiers. They called them rowdy after that and uh, all kinds of things. They were ordinary guys. Sure, they were rough and ready, but you tell them, most of these guys in combat, they didn't seem no different to me than anybody else. The Marauders were a tough bunch, there's no question about it. They were excellent soldiers. I think they were one of the most disciplined units there ever was when we were operating together. Today, Burma is known as Myanmar. At the beginning of the Second World War, it was controlled by the British and situated between two other American allies, India on the west and China on the east. In 1942, Burma was invaded by the Japanese. By driving the British out, Japan was able to block the Burma Road, which the Allies needed to supply China with vital weapons and equipment. It was very important for us to keep the Chinese in the war, because by keeping them in the war, we had two million Japanese tied up. And, and also, China was considered the future aircraft carrier for the assault on Japan. In August of 1943, President Franklin Roosevelt, England's Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Allied Southeast Asia Commander Lord Louis Mountbatten discussed the China-Burma-India situation at a conference in Quebec, Canada. Also there was a brilliant but unorthodox British Brigadier General named Ord C. Wingate. Wingate was a uh, man who in his very appearance was different. Some call him weird. Wingate had developed his way of fighting war, meaning long-range penetration. That meant that sending troops way behind the enemy lines to fight the infrastructure of the enemy rather than the frontline troops. Wingate had already conducted long-range missions using a force made up of British, Indian, Gurkha, and Burmese troops. They were known as the Chindits. Churchill wanted an American commando unit at that time to go back in with the British and try to recapture Burma. The leaders decided an American regiment under Wingate's British command should be formed. Their purpose? To destroy Japanese communications and supply routes while creating havoc behind the enemy's lines. President Roosevelt sent out the, to the various theaters of operation requests for volunteers for what they termed at that time a dangerous and hazardous mission. We were told when we originally volunteered that we could expect from 85 to 90 percent casualties. Many of my friends often say to me, how come you, you were so stupid 
as to volunteer for a mission that you were told there would be a good chance you would not survive it. There was an entirely different feeling at that time. We had a purpose. We had had Pearl Harbor, and everybody was anxious to get a crack at the Japanese. I had been there 28 months in the South Pacific, and uh, we felt it was time to start thinking about going back home. <laughs> and uh, we were interested in contributing to the shortening of the war in any way possible. Led by Colonel Charles Hunter, who reported to General Wingate, the approximately 3,000 volunteers from every state in the Union were assembled in India under the code name Galahad on October 29th, 1943. I've been in many outfits, but I'd never come across one like this in a variety of the people in it. You had in one and the same outfit eggheads from Harvard. You had kids off the streets of New York. Some of them were ex-convicts. You had a Sioux Indians from Dakota who were scouts. You had good, solid soldiers from the Midwest and Far West. So the putting together of all these people just made a mix that to me was unbeatable. The regiment was composed of our battalion, the third battalion of combat vets, the second battalion that had come from Panama and Trinidad, and the first battalion that had come over directly from the States. An extremely important component of the regiment was a group of 14 men who spoke fluent Japanese. Nisei, or the Americans of Japanese descent, as they like to be referred to, were a vital part of our operation. The uh, Nisei were called intelligence specialists. Our job was to translate occupied uh, documents, maps, order of battle, and also interrogate uh, POWs. We also intercepted enemy uh, communication. To prepare the men for survival in the horrendous Burmese environment, they underwent jungle combat training at camps in central India. During that three months that we trained in India, we maneuvered against the British forces that had come back out of Burma earlier. We got the benefit of their previous experience. We found out what they did right, what they did wrong, and it helped us. Each battalion was assigned 139 horses and mules. Because of what we call this long-range penetration operation, where you're fighting deep in behind the enemy lines, you had to manhandle everything. So we needed horses and mules to carry our heavier equipment. The rest of it we carried on our backs. During training, the regiment went through the first of a series of unexpected command changes. At the time, American Major General Joseph W. Stilwell held a number of important posts in the region. Among them was Chief of Staff to China's leader, Chiang Kai-shek. He also commanded all Chinese troops in India and Burma. When Stilwell heard that American troops would be under Wingate, he very definitely implied in his statements that it was a terrible situation. He allegedly approached Mountbatten and urged him to give him the American troops. And after January the 1st of 1944, Mountbatten suddenly decided to give the troops to, to Stilwell. As soon as Stilwell took over, he demoted Colonel Hunter to Chief of Staff and appointed one of his own men to lead the Americans. A 40-year-old West Point graduate from Hopkinton, Massachusetts, his name was Frank D. Merrill. Merrill was essentially a Dutch soldier. He'd been an intelligence officer, but he was not a combat man. He had never been a combat man, never led troops. So when he was put in charge of the Marauders, all of a sudden, here it was a little awkward there for a while. General Stilwell was now ready to take Burma back from the Japanese. General Merrill was told to get his troops ready to move out 
As they prepared to leave, the men knew many of them would not return. The word got out that some of the people didn't consider that we would uh, come out of, of wherever we were going as a unit, that the whole outfit might be destroyed. All of Marauders knew we were expendable. Nobody ever talked about it. And not because you were brave. What the hell? If you're stuck, you're stuck. I mean, to worry about being stuck isn't going to help you. Let the officers worry about it. They're going to try and get you out. Shortly before embarking, the regiment was given an official designation, the 5307th Composite Unit, provisional. But in a Life magazine article, a journalist referred to the unit as Merrill's Marauders. For the next six months, the Marauders endured arguably the most difficult conditions and continuous fighting of any American unit during the Second World War. The men of Merrill's Marauders always suffered from lack of information. When they left their camps in India, they had no idea what their specific missions would be once they entered Burma. Marching south and east over the Lido Road, they penetrated enemy territory on February 24, 1944. The battalions were led by their intelligence and reconnaissance platoons. The men referred to them as I and R. One of the most decorated soldiers in U.S. military history was a Marauder INR platoon leader named Logan Weston. We had 55 men in my platoon, and my platoon worked between uh, 12 and 24 hours in advance of the progress of the following battalion. And our mission was to scout out the trails that the battalion could move over. Uh, locate enemy positions. If it was a small unit, we would destroy them. If it was a larger unit, we would contain them in combat until the battalion caught up and was able to uh, finish them off. German-born Werner Katz was a private in Logan Weston's platoon. On February 25, 1944, as the platoon moved through the jungle, Cats emerged into a clearing. A short distance away, he saw what he thought at first was a Chinese soldier. I went forward, and then when I saw him, I said, my God, there's a Japanese. He tried to shoot, but I hit him before he probably could do something. I must have hit him in the face. By the same token, same token, I did fall down, and I saw on the left of me a machine gun. This machine gun opened up on me, and I had a stop button. And one of his bullets hit me there and hit me slightly in the nose. Returning fire, Lieutenant Weston and other members of the platoon pulled cats to safety. I was shivering, you know, I was scared. But after a little while, become a good soldier or a bad soldier, but become a fatalist. What can happen to you, you know? Or you see a guy lose an arm, or see another guy get killed next to you. It's very, very sad, and you like to run away, but after a little while it says, you have to do here and you have to fight, and you become a different human being, different thinking. Werner Katz was the first marauder to kill one of the enemy. The bullet that grazed his nose also marked him as the first marauder to be wounded. On February 28th, the marauders were already deep in enemy territory when General Merrill informed them that their first mission would be at a village called Wallabum. We didn't know what our first mission was. After approximately uh, 100 miles, uh, we were told that we had to hurry up to hit the Japanese on the main road into North Burma. The Wallabum mission was to establish a roadblock to prevent the Japanese supplies from moving further north to support the Japanese units engaged against the Chinese. The marauders had barely enough time to establish roadblocks before units of Japan's 18th Division launched massive artillery attacks. We, we took a real pounding. Lack of artillery is a big drawback when we got in that position, because we had nothing to fight back with except small arms. 
Despite their artillery and a two-to-one manpower advantage, the Japanese were taking heavy losses. The Japanese thought they were fighting Chinese, so that when the Japanese attacked, they were not up against Chinese troops with single firing rifles. They were up against people that had automatic weapons, and they just had not realized that that was what they were up against. We always felt in a firefight, we're going to come out ahead just because we, we can shoot better. Our rifle, the M1 Garand rifle, was a superb rifle. Uh, we, the, the Tommy gun was a damn good semi-automatic. The BAR was damn heavy, but believe me, if the man was well protected who used it, he could do great damage with it. Another powerful weapon in the Marauder's arsenal was the Nisei Interpreter. While we were putting in the roadblock at Walla Boom, we noticed there was a, a telephone wire going down through the trees. So one of our Japanese military intelligence specialists, Roy Matsumoto, borrowed my field phone, climbed the tree, tapped into the line, and he heard this Japanese soldier saying that he, he knew there were enemy in the area, he didn't know exactly where. They told him, the general, they were guarding this ammunition dump, and then they stupidly gave the coordinates a position of where the dump was. So we immediately got in touch with the P-38 squadron that was flying close support to us. I to told them where the dump was, and they come in with 500-pound bombs under their wings, and they knocked out the dump. As the battle at Wallabom raged on, the American supplies were running out at an alarming rate. Actually, we had run out of food the first night we were there and had nothing to eat for two and a half or three days. And before the battle was finally over, we were out of ammunition. If the Japanese had realized that the Americans were totally out of ammunition, the battle would probably have been totally different. I don't see how it could have been otherwise because they would have overrun us. Finally, after more than three days and nights of ceaseless fighting, Chinese forces arrived to reinforce the marauders. But by then, an amazing victory had been achieved. The Japanese were pulling out. They had success after success fighting against other troops, so that when they came against the marauders for the first time at Wallabong, they expected instant success. Instead, they were wiped out, hundreds of them. The river was red from their blood. Approximately 800 Japanese were killed at Wallabum. In comparison, only eight Americans died. Still, 37 more were wounded and desperately needed care. Without further medical attention, many more would die. General Merrill had definitely stated there was no plans for how to take care of the wounded other than to leave them with the natives. There was no plan for evacuation. The thing that really worked out was during the Battle of Wallabom, these little Piper Cubs were coming in, bringing messages and whatnot, and we found that we could put one wounded man on each plane. They would land anywhere. They would land in a rice paddy field. Uh, I, I don't think shortness of runway ever concerned them. Uh, I've seen them land on sandbars in a river. They were fearless. They did a wonderful job. As a matter of fact, a number of times they cracked up. We lost a couple of their pilots, but we never did have to leave a wounded man behind. The victory at Wallabum gave a boost to the Marauders' morale. They not only defeated a much larger enemy force, they also destroyed the myth that the Japanese 18th Division was invincible. Many misinformed marauders believed that their success meant they'd be going home. A lot of folks were under the impression that they would have one big battle and they would be relieved. But I think that was wishful thinking on their part because Stillwell didn't have that idea and I don't think that Merrill had that idea. After three days of rest on March 12, 1944, the 5307th received orders to pursue a second mission. It would begin with another victory, but end with the 2nd Battalion fighting for its life 
on a mountaintop the marauders called Maggot Hill. Before the marauders could start their second mission, they had to take on critically needed supplies. But the task of supplying the 5307th was in itself an extremely dangerous mission. The, the supply drop process we used was borrowed from the Chindits, Wingate's Chindits, with whom we had trained in India. It was uh, the only way of getting supplies in the people behind enemy lines. So you had to use planes to bring in every bullet, every bit of food we had. And this took great skill on the part of the pilots. They had to come in low in order to hit the target properly, but also to avoid too much Japanese interference. After all, the Japanese had fighter planes around. We admired them greatly. We also admired the men who did the packing and loading and pushing out of supplies. Resupplied on March 11, 1944, the three battalions were told they would split up, a decision that nearly proved disastrous. The second and third battalions moved east, then south, through the Burmese villages of Samshingyang and Nepunga to Inkongatong. The first battalion headed south to Shadaza. The first battalion had such a terrible time moving through the jungle that they were extremely slow and they had something like 15 or 20 actions with the Japanese on the way to this roadblock. When the 1st Battalion finally arrived at Shadazup, they discovered a Japanese camp on the opposite side of a river. Remaining hidden, the marauders planned a surprise attack for the next morning. They sent one combat team across the river, and they kept the other combat team on the other side of the river where they could give them mortar support and other things. They caught the Japanese when they were getting up to get breakfast and whatnot. They, they slaughtered the Japanese. By the time the 1st Battalion had reached Shadazup, the other two Marauder Battalions had already established their roadblocks. They were ordered, however, to abandon their positions under fire. A major Japanese force threatened to entrap the Americans unless they could escape back in the direction they had come, toward the village of Nepunga. The only thing that prevented this and allowed them to get to Nepunga in time to prevent being trapped was Logan Weston's platoon. I recommended by radio to the battalion that he move me south, and from that position, I could block enemy coming up from the south and keep the escape route for the two battalions open for their evacuation. And it was during that three days and four nights that I uh, had to keep withdrawing to avoid being encircled or cut off. That was a harrowing experience and a constant changing situation. While Weston's platoon fought to slow the enemy advance, 3rd Battalion headed to Samshengyang. The approximately 800 men of the 2nd Battalion raced to Nepunga to await the inevitable Japanese onslaught. The 2nd Battalion had been ordered to stay there to block the trail so the Japanese could not go further north and get in back of the Chinese. By this time, the arduous Burmese conditions and fighting were taking a toll on the 5307th. Disease and severe weight loss from malnutrition were rampant. The Marauder's original commander, Colonel Charles Hunter, again took charge when General Merrill himself was evacuated due to heart problems. On March 28, 1944, the Japanese began to surround the weary 2nd Battalion. The Japanese units that I had been delaying surrounded the entire battalion within 12 hours. So we then found out that I had not been opposing a battalion, I had been opposing a regiment. The Pumba became known as Maggot Hill because of the several hundred dead Japanese surrounding the perimeter and approximately 100 dead mules and horses with millions of blue bottle flies. 
The odor was so great after several days, you could smell it for a mile or more. During the siege, many supplies ran desperately low, including water. At Nipunga, the Japanese captured the only water hole, and there was no way to get water, obviously. On March 30th, a marauder reconnaissance patrol slipped out of the Nipunga perimeter on a mission to see if the water hole could be recaptured. Unfortunately, they came back in the wrong end of the perimeter, and the men where they went in didn't know it was our own troops, and they fired on them, and my best friend was killed there, plus some of the other men in his squad as well. You know, those things happen. I know uh, some people uh, make quite a fuss about this happening, but that's a war for you. On the eighth day of the siege, Lieutenant Edward McLogan ordered one of his Nisei interpreters to infiltrate the enemy's position. We did serve in various capacities, and one was to listen in to the enemy. <clears throat> and uh, we would crawl up, and in most cases, it was just regular chat, but there were cases where their enemy plan was revealed. Gloria Matsumoto listened to Japanese conversations and realized that they were going to make a pull a Banzai attack early in the morning. This information was, of course, passed on to his commanding officer, and everything was set up to greet this anticipated Banzai attack. They were fanatical. They would charge right into your machine guns time after time after time. We had bodies piled up so high in front of our machine guns. We had to kick the bodies away from the guns so that we could fire them. Roy Matsumoto's bravery had averted disaster. If this information had not been available, it's quite possible that they, they could have broken into the perimeter and perhaps overrun the entire area. While 2nd Battalion was barely hanging on, 3rd Battalion attempted to break the Japanese stranglehold by launching attacks from their base at Samshingyang. The enemy patrolled the trail all the way to Samshingyang, and we had to fight through four miles of resistance to relieve the trapped battalion. On the 2nd of April, two 75-millimeter pack howitzers were airdropped to the attacking Americans. Finally, the marauders had artillery. Four days later, the 1st Battalion arrived, having not eaten in days, to also assist in freeing their comrades. When the Battle of Shadowzoop was over, we were placed on forced march to try to rescue the 2nd Battalion, which is under siege at Napunga. On Easter Sunday morning, April 9th, 1944, after 12 days of relentless battle, the siege ended. The Japanese were gone. When the Battle of Nipunga concluded, casualties and disease had reduced the marauders to about 1,400 men, half of their original size. The ranks were so depleted the command determined the 5307th could not go on as it was. Again, the rumor began to circulate that the marauders would be shipped out of Burma. It was not the case. Their most difficult mission was still to come. On April 17, 1944, General Joseph Stilwell and General Frank Merrill, who had recovered from his heart attack and resumed marauder command, met to plan a third mission. The objective, the airfield near the city of Michinon. The strategic importance of taking the Japanese all-weather airstrip at Michinon was to prevent them from using the strip for their fighter planes to intercept our C-47s and our supply planes 
flying from India to China with uh, ammunition and supplies for the Chinese army at 21,000 feet over the Himalayas. The marauders were in no condition to take on another mission, however. First, they had to be reinforced. Each battalion was enlarged by adding Chinese troops and native Burmese fighters known as Kachins. Kachins were the tribe that dominated northern Burma. They were mountain people, hill people, who knew their territory. Every path was known to them. And they had a sixth sense, almost, of knowing who else was around. They could tell you that the Japanese was coming to the next village before anybody had seen them. Luckily for us, they were on our side. They hated the Japanese. The marauders worked hard to be friendly with their native allies. Here, in a rare break from the trials of war, General Merrill and other marauders are seen dancing with the Kachins. Once reorganized, the marauders were as ready as they could be. In an effort to boost disintegrating morale, Stillwell and Merrill promised the men they would be shipped out of Burma as soon as Michina Airfield was captured. To reach Michina, 65 miles away, the marauders had to cross mountains known as the Kumon Range. It was really a grueling, grueling, grueling affair going over that mountain trail. The very day we left, the monsoon started. That equals 200 inches of rain in northern Burma every year. Well, monsoon there was just sheets of water coming down and trying to walk. It was almost impossible. These mule skinners always had a challenge dealing with these animals. And when the monsoons came, mules would slip and slide and some of them to their death down the mountain with all their supplies on their backs. During the march to Michina, the marauders were confronted with a new deadly enemy. Typhus or Sitchikamusi fever was, of course, the the dangerous one, and we never knew about that condition until we were going on our third mission over the 6,500-foot mountain pass, where we got a radio message that we had this condition. What happened was the temperature would go up as high as 106, and if they weren't evacuated quickly, they would all die. More than 40 members of Merrill's marauders died from typhus. To make matters worse, the ability to combat disease was severely diminished by the marauders' diet. The food situation was unique and terrible. All we got was K ration, which looked and felt like a brick. These K rations were, were only meant for emergency use originally. They were meant for some pilot who had been shot down and had to live two or three days before they rescued him. They're not meant for men carrying heavy packs, doing fighting over a three-month period. Some of the men lost 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, even 80 pounds. But there was nothing we could do. I mean, we just had to keep going. You had to keep up with the troops, or otherwise uh, you'd be left behind. We did try to help each other from time to time, especially when you had to climb some steep incline. Uh, it was uh, a very difficult situation. The marauder's terrible condition was made even worse by a creature that attached itself to the men's skin. We were affected during the last part of the crossing of the Kumon mountain range by swarms of leeches. And they were bloodsuckers, usually about two or two and a half inches long and they'd hold a lot of blood and then drop off. 10 days into the march, contact with the enemy was made. Major battles were fought in and around the villages of Ritpong and Tingkrukong. These engagements served to occupy the attention of the Japanese, allowing Colonel Hunter's battalion to slip by unnoticed to Michina. On May 17th, 
a well-planned attack completely surprised the Japanese. By midday, the airfield was in marauder hands. Stillwell and Merrill were ecstatic. It seemed the campaign was finally over for Merrill's marauders. They had definitely been promised that they would be evacuated en masse as soon as the airfield was taken, and the Chinese would take over and complete the battle. Unfortunately, the generals were not prepared to capitalize on the marauders' sudden success. What happened was General Merrill had said, we will have food and ammunition as soon as the airfield is captured. That didn't arrive for a couple of days. The Japanese had perhaps five or 600 men there when we took the airfield. By the time we got ammunition and food, they had something like 4,000 men there before it was over. The Japanese were now using the nearby city of Michina to stage counterattacks on the airfield. The task of driving them out was given to the Chinese. Their attempts tragically failed, however, when two of their units fired on each other and hundreds of their own troops were killed. This was a real good setback because they were counted on to do that job. So then we had the problem of what to do then. The 5307th dug in. Michinaw had become a quagmire with no end in sight. The remaining 600 members of Merrill's Marauders weren't going anywhere. As the situation around Michinaw worsened, Merrill's Marauders were physically unfit for combat. At the same time, General Stilwell was in a political bind. It would look like favoritism if he pulled the Americans out while the British, who had recently arrived, and the Chinese continued to fight on. To complicate matters, Stilwell couldn't count on his own allies when he needed them the most. The marauders greatly admired the valor and contribution of Chinese soldiers, but Chinese leadership was constantly holding them back. Stilwell's problems were just enormous uh, because um, Chiang Kai-shek didn't want his troops to fight, and he was always in radio contact with his officers. And uh, they took, really took orders from Chiang Kai-shek and rejected orders from General Stilwell. By the end of May, despite every effort, Stilwell could not stem the flow of sick and exhausted marauders being shipped out. Colonel Charles Hunter again took command of the Americans in a time of crisis when General Merrill suffered a second heart attack. Hunter was able, at the very end, when somebody else might have failed, to keep what was left of the marauders together and keep them fighting. He did it just by showing he loved these men. He had respect for them, and um, he hated to do what he did, but damn it, we're all in this together. Colonel Hunter was convinced his men could hold the airfield, but higher command disagreed. They feared the airfield was in imminent danger of being lost unless replacement troops were found. What happened was that when we got into trouble at Michina, a lot of the marauders had been in the hospital for months, and somebody came up with the bright idea that they would bring some of those guys up to the front as replacements. And that's the reason they ordered all these men, sick men and wounded men, to come back. It was totally unnecessary, according to, to Colonel Hunter. Some believe an overzealous member of Stillwell's staff misinterpreted his orders. In any case, the incident fostered an extreme dislike for the general among many of the marauders. The anger even reached the point with one marauder. They said if, he, if Joe Stillwell ever appeared in his in his sights, he shoot him in the back. Eventually, as weeks passed into months, reinforcements began to arrive. Stillwell flew on engineers from the road, but these poor guys were not too well trained in combat, and they were thrust in there to see what they could do. But unfortunately, they were ill-equipped to do the job. On July 12th, a unit of American reinforcements was decimated in a disastrous friendly fire incident. 
a bombing raid during the Battle of Mishnah was, was ordered by the Air Force, and they came over the wrong direction. They dropped the bombs at the wrong location. I remember the figure that was reported that day was that uh, there was 119 men killed, wounded, or buried alive. Despite their dire situation, the marauders and their allies continued to hold the airfield and attack the Japanese positions around the city. So we uh, finally got replacements in India, 2,900 men. So we started to get people coming in, fresh green troops who were well trained, and they helped us enormously to finally do what was necessary. The city of Michinaw fell to the Allies on August 3rd, 1944 two and a half months after the airfield had been captured. Out of the nearly 2,700 marauders who entered Burma, only 200 were left, when seven days later, the 5307th was consolidated with the 475th Infantry, and Merrill's marauders became part of history. The Burma Road was reopened on January 28, 1945, and supplies again started flowing through Burma to China. The campaign was over, but the Burma experience never left the hearts and minds of the men of Merrill's marauders. I remember the wonderful volunteers who wanted to fight, wanted to war, get the war over with, and they did their utmost. A lot of them died uh, on their feet, you know what I mean? But they should be remembered as a very brave bunch of guys, wonderful guys. Years later, Colonel Hunter described Merrill's marauders as the most beat upon and yet the most unrewarded regiment size unit in World War II. Despite his bleak assessment, history has not forgotten the 5307th. The Marauders were unique in military history as a force organized for a dangerous mission that went in without any of the usual support and did it to the bitter end with a brand of endurance, fortitude, and resourcefulness that was incredible in military lore. In 1966, the Marauders were awarded the Presidential Unit Citation for Extraordinary Heroism in Action. The 5307th was also uniquely honored when every Marauder received a Bronze Star for heroic or meritorious achievement or service. So when I volunteered, it was the best call I ever made. We fought a hard campaign, we were good soldiers, and we brought back, if you weren't, glory. Although the 5307th designation was retired, the Marauder legacy lives on in the U.S. Army Rangers. We're very proud of the fact that today's Rangers are descended from our battle experiences in Burma. The only Ranger Regiment extant today, the 75th, carries the Marauder colors and shoulder patch. It may very well be that Merrill's Marauders will serve as a model for warfare in the future, a dimension of fighting that is still needed in today's world and in tomorrow's world.